Good evening. Welcome to Nova Southeastern University and the Farquhar College of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Speaker Series featuring Nobel Laureate Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I am pleased to see so many students, faculty, and community guests joining our exploration of this year's annual theme, Good and Evil. We are joined this evening by simulcast by students and faculty at our student education centers in Fort Myers, Kendall, Tampa, Orlando, West Palm Beach, and Jacksonville. My name is Don Rosenblum. I serve as Dean for the Farquhar College of Arts and Sciences. Nova Southeastern University is committed to the values of open expression and exploration of ideas. Our program this evening would not be possible without the strong support of university leadership, including our Board of Trustees and Executive Officers, who recognize that the role of higher education is to encourage reflection and debate on ideas that advance people and the community. It gives me great, great pleasure to welcome and introduce Chancellor of the University, Ray Ferraro, Jr. Thank you, Dean. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the students, faculty, administration, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to Nova Southeastern University. Let me begin by acknowledging NSU's College of Arts and Sciences and Dean Don Rosenblum for hosting this presentation as part of the college's distinguished speaker series reflecting this year's theme of good and evil. To you and your colleagues, Dean Rosenblum, thank you for creating tonight's event. Let me also add, as the Dean did, my welcome to members of NSU's Board of Trustees in attendance, our students, our staff, particularly our faculty, and our community leadership. Now finally, allow me to add my personal welcome to our distinguished guest, Archbishop Emeritus and Nobel Laureate Desmond Tutu, who will be formally introduced in a moment. This has been a historic period in our university's history. Earlier this week, NSU welcomed another Nobel Laureate and spiritual leader, His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama of Tibet. Having champions of, for peace such as the Dalai Lama and now Archbishop Desmond Tutu reminds our students, the NSU community and the community at large of how, how each of us can make a positive difference with our families, in the community, in the, and in the one world we all share together. To each and every one of you, thank you for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. I'm looking forward, as I know you are, to enjoying this evening along with you and hearing from the Archbishop. Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Chancellor Ferraro. Each year, faculty members in the College of Arts and Sciences participate in the selection of our distinguished speakers. Our annual theme also helps to frame special topics courses, faculty lectures, and student performances and productions. Tonight's program is hosted by our college's Division of Humanities under the leadership of Dr. Marlisa Santos. Earlier this week, faculty hosted workshops related to our speaker and the annual theme. The Division of Math, Science and Technology hosted a faculty panel examining global climate change and its effect on Africa. 
The Division of Social and Behavioral Sciences hosted a faculty panel on evil across societies. This past weekend, the Division of Performing and Visual Arts presented a student theatrical performance influenced by our annual theme. Thank you to the faculty members and students participating in these programs. I am pleased to recognize the directors of these academic divisions. Dr. Matthew He, director of the Division of Math, Science and Technology. <laughs> Dr. Tom Fagan, division director in social and behavioral sciences. and Dr. Mike Caldwell, Division Director in Performing and Visual Arts. <laughs> College faculty are committed to providing outstanding programs of study. Through these programs, we seek to enhance students' critical thinking and communication skills, responsible citizenship, and a commitment to lifelong learning. Our lecture by Archbishop Desmond Tutu is a reflection of our commitment to the values and core commitments. It is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. Andrea Shaw, Assistant Director in the Division of Humanities, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Rosenblum. Human beings are fundamentally good. The aberration, in fact, is the evil one. For God created us ultimately for God, for goodness, for laughter, for joy, for compassion, for caring. These are the words of the Most Reverend Desmond Mapilo Tutu, Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town, whom I have the pleasure and honor of introducing this evening as we contemplate the theme of good and evil. Born in Klerksdorp, South Africa, Archbishop Tutu followed in his father's footsteps and became a teacher. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree and taught for three years before moving on to study theology and become an ordained priest in the Anglican Church. He later earned a master's degree in theology and has held numerous positions in the church and in education. During the 1970s, Archbishop Tutu became increasingly critical of South Africa's then existent system of apartheid, a legalized form of racial segregation. Archbishop Tutu consistently called for justice while encouraging reconciliation. His commitment to peace and his faith that it would prevail earned him the 1984 Nobel Peace Prize. And in 1986, he was appointed the Archbishop of Cape Town, becoming the first black cleric to lead the Anglican Church in South Africa. In 1994, after South Africa's first democratic election, Archbishop Tutu was appointed chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a body designed as a venue for both victims of human rights violations as well as perpetrators of that violence to give testaments of their experiences. In 1998, he retired from that position. Long known as the voice of South Africa's conscience, Archbishop Tutu continues an energetic crusade for peace and human dignity around the world. He currently serves as chairman of a body known as the Elders. This is an independent group of eminent global leaders brought together by Nelson Mandela. The members offer their collective influence and experience to support peace building, help address major causes of human suffering, and promote the shared interests of humanity. Archbishop Tutu has been married to his wife Leah for over 50 years, and they have four children. He is a prolific writer, and his numerous books include Crying in the Wilderness, The Struggle for Justice in South Africa, The Rainbow People of God, No Future Without Forgiveness, and most recently, Made for Goodness and Why This Makes All the Difference. 
Archbishop Tutu has even had a recording career, and among other projects, he is one of the narrators on the audiobook for Nelson Mandela's story collection titled Nelson Mandela's Favorite African Folk Tales. One of the stories in this collection is from the sand people of South Africa and tells of a praying mantis, yes, the insect, who relentlessly tries to capture the moon. This mantis wants to sit on the moon and circle the skies so that the other animals will say, he must surely be a god and we should praise him. The unrelenting mantis tries to lasso the moon, to ambush it as it rises, to haul its reflection out of a water hole, and to pierce it with a stake. But is he successful? No. Finally, in anger, he throws a stone at the moon, shattering its reflection and blinding himself. As a result, he cannot sleep and suffers in dreadful pain, all the while chastising himself for ever wanting to hijack the moon and strut through the skies. In agony and disgrace, the mantis takes a prayerful stance, holding up his front legs in supplication and pleads for the moon to return his sight. While no one would be surprised if the moon completely ignored the mantis, it does not. Instead, the moon generously grants his prayer and removes all the splinters so the mantis can see clearly once more. It is this forgiveness for which Archbishop Tutu advocates. This readiness to do good in the face of evil, to see how, like the mantis, people's arrogance and thirst for prestige can literally blind them. Archbishop Tutu's commitment to peace and his faith in the essential goodness of human beings are an inspiration to us all. It is with great respect and admiration I ask you this evening to join me in this privileged opportunity to welcome Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Thank you so very much for your kind words of introduction. Thank you, Dean and Mr. Chancellor, for your, for your words of welcome. <clears throat> Good evening. <sighs> that is rather a lousy response. <laughs> Good, e good evening. Ah, that's, that's slightly better. <laughs> Thank you so very, very much for the privilege of speaking in this series. A few years ago, uh, my, wa my wife and I were walking through the airport at, in uh, Atlanta and we, we got to the security checkpoint and a senior woman uh, security officer uh, saw me and she, she was gushing, oh, uh, Archbishop, uh, Archbishop. <laughs> Which is which is rather nice, uh, <laughs> and then she called across to a, a younger colleague, so and so, uh, come here, and this young one came. <laughs> she she was sauntering across, and and the older one says, "This is Archbishop Tutu." Blank stare. <laughs> I mean, you know, I mean, you know, Archbishop Tutu. And even more blank stare. <laughs> and then this young one saunters back to her place. And, and as she walks across, she says, He must have been before my time. <laughs> Uh, 
which I, which I thought was rather, <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's very good for your soul uh, <laughs> when you, when you sometimes think that you are maybe you ought to be well known, uh, and and it turns out that you're not quite. Uh, if I were to have asked you here tonight uh, after the awful earthquake in Haiti, how many people you may have heard crying out plaintively perhaps but possibly angrily crying out why did God not stop this? I expect that there would be quite a few of you here tonight for almost always in the aftermath of something like that disaster your Katrina here people will say but man isn't isn't this God omnipotent? Shouldn't this all powerful God what what the heck is the use of a God who is powerful but does not stop? evil and suffering and usually you will get people say it must mean one of two things which is the kind of dilemma faced by those who claim to believe that God is omnipotent, all-powerful, and can stop this evil, in this case, the evil of a Haitian earthquake. That this God can stop this suffering but won't, in which case they would then say, well, God may be all-powerful, but stop kidding yourself, this God is cruel, callous, and cares not a brass farthing for all the world's suffering. He For such a God must quite obviously be a macho, masculine, divine. No decent female. Would be... <laughs> I know who are the majority in any community and I want to get on the right side of them. <laughs> no decent female would be so unmoved by so much suffering and evil. And survey it all unimpressed by the anguish and the agony. So, God can't be omnipotent. Oh, God is loving, God would want to put an end to all of it. Sorry, that first one is, it must be that this God is not a loving God. 
And then this loving God on the one hand really does want to, to, to stop the ghastly agony. Unfortunately, this God is something of a wimp. He's loving but not omnipotent. Unfortunately, or perhaps later on we should say fortunately, for those of you who are theists, those of you who believe in God, there is in fact no escape. Because especially in the Judeo-Christian faith, You can't escape in one or other of these forms because the adherence of these faiths claim that God is both all powerful and all loving. But then why, oh, why can there be tsunamis? Why can there be holocausts? Why can there be 9-11s? Why there, can there be genocides? Why can there be ethnic cleansing? Why can there be cruel, oppressive dictatorships? Why can there be harsh regimes as Stalin's was and with all his gulags? How come there are such awful, oppressive regimes like Burma? How come there could be apartheid cruelties? And what about disease? I mean, look at what the HIV and AIDS pandemic is doing, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, I've put, I've put the dilemma as harshly as I can. How can we go on believing in God as being good and all loving. Friends, God has placed us in what we call a universe. A universe. Not, not a chaos. A universe. And because it is a universe, it has regularities. It has what are summed up as natural laws. That's what makes it a universe and not a cacophony where you don't know from one moment to the next what is going to be happening. In this universe, we know that go anywhere, you go to Timbuktu or you go to... Well, when you're in Johannesburg, you might say you go to Alaska. But uh, <laughs> you go anywhere and you say, well, this thing is water. So it must be in Timbuktu, it must be H2O. And hey, even in Alaska, it is H2O. And it is this uniformity that makes it possible for you to be here. 
and say you're studying science. It is this uniformity, this predictability. This is what makes a relatively straightforward life possible. You are able therefore to predict, you say, if you don't eat a decent diet, sorry, you are going to contract TB. You know that because this is the kind of world we have been placed in. When you do this, it has that consequence. And if you have TB and you are given drugs and you maintain the regimen, why? You will be cured. And it's no, it's no magic. It's because you are in this kind of world. You know there are 24 hours in the day, although I, I know that sometimes students have thought there might be slightly more than that. <laughs> so what does all of this mean? When a baby falls out of the window of a fourth floor, and you say, please, please God, please God intervene. Supposing, supposing then God actually did intervene and suspended the natural law of gravity and instead of a baby plunging down to the ground ah voila she floats she's not going to go down oh, oh God is good mm -hmm. that's wonderful for the baby that's wonderful for her family <laughs> It's not so wonderful for other people because buildings now start floating. <laughs> people come out of a room and suddenly find the scattering around all over the place. Or, or God intervenes and ah, as the baby comes down the ground changes its texture and becomes squashy and, and the baby oh has a soft landing that's again okay for the baby but if you've been driving your car <laughs> and you get to this spot and, and it's no longer a firm tarmac, well, you're not likely to want to thank God for that intervention. <laughs> yeah. One of the incredible things, dear friends, one of the incredible things is, you know, God <laughs> has given you and me, all of us, an incredible faculty. God has given us the gift 
of choice. Sha. That is what makes you and me. That's what makes us moral creatures. Those who can choose between right and wrong, good and bad. If there are a few dogs around here and you chuck a, a lump of meat into that group of dogs, they won't usually say after you. <laughs> <laughs> The, 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 the first one who can dash and get that piece of meat dashes and is <laughs> triumphant. How many times have we, have we been told family hold back? You know, when you've got visitors and there's food on the table but maybe not enough food uh, and, 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 and most families have, have their own signals that look... Uh, <laughs> give, give, the, give the visitors the chance to get there first. Uh, stay behind, stay behind. Because we are able... It's an incredible gift. We are able to choose to love or to hate. We are able to choose to be good, to be bad. And you know what? This omnipotent God that we worship has such a deep, deep reverence for the gift that God has given us that God had much rather we went freely to hell than compel us to go to heaven. Isn't that incredible? <laughs> that God has created us to be persons, persons, not automatons. And, and our, it is a creature autonomy, but it is a real autonomy. It is an autonomy that actually enables me to reject God. Hey, hey, oh, can you imagine if I had this, the power that God has? Because you see, do you know what? You are so special. If you remember, at the beginning of the Bible, they speak of how God breathes the breath of God into this lump, and this lump becomes a person. Well, God doesn't blow us up like a balloon, and, and then tie it up and throw it away. No. Do you know that as you are sitting there, as you are sitting there as I stand here, you, you are being upheld in existence from moment to moment by this incredible God. God doesn't say, bye-bye. God says, God says, you, I would disintegrate into the nothingness from which God's creative fiat has brought me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, oh. I mean, this is part of why Human beings are such incredible creatures. 
This is what makes each one of us, each single one of us, whether you are tall or stumpy like me, <laughs> whether you are substantial or have an hourglass figure, whether you are beautiful or, or not so beautiful. Hmm? You are this incredible thing, this one who is held tenderly, lovingly, caringly in, in, in the hands of You know, one of the prophets says, your name is engraved on the palms of God's hands. You, 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 you. You, you, you. And, and that's why oppression and injustice are not just awful, are not just evil. They are blasphemous. That they can want to treat one such as if they were less than this. You are precious with a preciousness that cannot be computed. And, and, and so, even when you say, I hate God, I don't believe in God, I am able to say that because this God enables me to remain in being. Now imagine if I had the, that power. <laughs> Somebody says to me, this, this one, I give you the power to exist, and you say you hate me. <laughs> Snuff you out. But God, gives me the power to reject God. <laughs> mm. And somewhere in the scriptures they say, <laughs> God knows you by name. By name. What, there are maybe 3,000, 4,000 of you here. Realize that God does not see you en masse. God knows you, Jack. Hey, Jack. <laughs> Mary. Peter. <laughs> and, then, and, then, and they say, even, even the hairs of your head are numbered. Mm. Say, well. Heads of, heads of, heads of my, well, thank you God, yes. <laughs> but it is one of the, it's one of the most incredible things. Yeah. And so, what is it saying? It is saying, God has given us this gift. It is a gift. It is a real gift. This faculty to enable me to become a moral being. And so for God to intervene when I am making a choice so that I make the right choice. would be for God to nullify the gift that God has given me. Eh? And so what happens? What happens? Here I am having to make a choice. Hate, love. 
yes, God wants me to choose love. But I have, yes, a Christian, but nonetheless genuine autonomy. And I choose. If it looks like I'm going to be making the wrong choice, God does not then intervene to ensure that I make the right choice. God has given me a gift and it is a real gift. God, the omnipotent, the all-powerful, watches. Watches as they choose to kill six million Jews. God watches. God watches. God watches like a parent. Most of you are not there yet. But I will tell you that there is nothing more painful than watching your child make what you know is the wrong choice and you know that they are going to pay an enormous price and really you can do nothing. You have tried to bring this child up and now you say, yeah, yeah. The pain and anguish of a parent seeing a child say yes to drugs. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh. And, and uh, mother, daddy really can't do anything. Yes, they will pray, but the decision, the decision is yours. And so, so God. You know, God cries. God cries many times. Because God looks on and God sees there they make the choice. We are going to we are going to massacre six million. God watches and sees people actually using the Bible to justify why apartheid is right. Eh? Eh? And you think God would, would, would send a lightning bolt to zap them? No, 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 no. God sits there, this omnipotent God sits there, impotent. Isn't it an incredible paradox? The omnipotent is impotent. God watches, watches, cooks, cooks, clan. Use, use, use the symbol of the cross. And they use it to justify lynching blacks. And God looks on. And God weeps. <laughs> and God looks and sees and sees and sees this massive military machine come from Israel and into Gaza and God weeps God weeps
God weeps when, when God looks and sees what he are doing to God's children in Darfur. God looks and sees the ghastly things they are doing in Zimbabwe. And God weeps. God weeps. Hello. Can you, can you imagine if you, if you saw me in the red light district? <laughs> Which of you would say, no, 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 we, we know the Archbishop is carrying out uh, a pastoral visit? <laughs> well, that is where you would have actually found Jesus. Jesus would be in the, in the red light district. <laughs> That's why you would find him. Because the friends that he collected around him were the, what were regarded as the riffraff, the scum, prostitutes, sinners. And in those days they didn't like tax collectors. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether that's changed very much now, but I mean, yeah, uh, that was the company God's son kept. He didn't walk, he didn't walk around with archbishops and uh, chancellors and deans. Uh, you know. no, 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 don't get me wrong. I, I can assure you these are men of integrity. <laughs> uh, amazing that he should have said, you know the story that he tells, he says, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. <laughs> Wait a bit, man. Wait a bit. I mean, we know that you are a nice guy, but when did we see you? And, 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 and Jesus says, <laughs> when you did it to that insignificant nobody, you were actually doing it to me. You were actually doing it to me. <clears throat> Our impotent God waits because God is waiting for collaborators. God is waiting for partners. God is saying, please help me. Please help me. You know, there's somebody hungry. And God wants to feed that hungry person. I have still got to see hamburgers floating from heaven <laughs> to feed that hungry person. If that hungry person is going to be fed, <laughs> You, 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 I, I eh, have to be God's hands and eyes and feet. When, when, when the rulers, the apartheid rulers, were strutting as if they were invincible, we used to say to our people, hey, don't worry, <laughs> they have already lost, despite the armies and their police, because this is a moral universe. But, God, I mean, why don't you zap them with a lightning bolt, man, and, and just swim at them? Remove them? No. God wanted South Africa to be free, but God wasn't going to intervene in that kind of way. God intervenes through us. God intervenes through us. 
And I have to tell you, we are free today because of so many of you in the international community who helped us. Our victory is your victory. And so I come, I, I come and I say, uh, on behalf of millions of our people, hey, thank you. Thank you for helping us to be free. And it was, you know, it was students like yourselves, not exclusively, but it was, I used to come to this country and I would, I would come round about May when you are supposed to be now, I mean, really concentrating on your grades and your degrees and things. And I would go to university campuses and you would have students sitting out in demonstrations seeking to force their universities to divest. <laughs> and you did an extraordinary thing, or at least your predecessors did an extraordinary thing. You had a hugely popular president in, in President Reagan who, who was totally opposed to sanctions. But what the students did and all of those other people involved in the anti-apartheid movement, what they did was they changed the moral climate in this country. They, they, helped, they helped Congress to pass the anti-apartheid legislation with a veto override, a presidential veto override. <laughs> And so, I've got to tell you something. I have, I have a, a magic wand. Only the wise can see it, <laughs> all right? And this magic wand, when I wave it over people, ah, it turns them into instant South Africans. <laughs> so, I take it out. You can see it, don't you? <laughs> and I wave it over you. And so I say, fellow South Africans, <laughs> let's give these Americans a real humdinger. Come on, come on! <laughs> now, now, wait a bit, wait a bit. If if you had shackles on your wrists and ankles and somebody came along and broke those shackles and you have the chance to say thank you, you think you'd be sitting down and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> now let's just, let's just show how you'd feel if you were set free. You give these Americans a, a, a humping of a... Okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, I, I, I wave it over you and you revert to your former shy self, yes. Uh. But that's for real, actually. That is for real. You, you did something you have not always thought about you helped Nelson Mandela walk out of jail. You enabled us on the 27th of April 1994 to vote for the first time in the land of our birth.
so I finish. God says, please help me. God says, I look for human collaborators. Help me. Help me. Help me with things like making poverty history. Help me. Help me, says God, so that nations can begin. Can you tell me when we, we will ever get it into our noggins? <laughs> Just look at the money we spend on arms. Eh? Billions! And we know that a small fraction of those budgets of death and destruction would ensure that God's children everywhere had enough water, clean water to drink, had enough food to eat, had a decent home. If you are still arguing about health care, well, you would enable people everywhere in the world to have decent health care. Right? God is waiting for you to get people to reduce their carbon footprint. <laughs> Climate change is for real. It's not something that is still going to happen. It is happening. ice is melting. Polar bears are drowning because the ice is thin. Islands are being overwhelmed because the sea level is rising. And you're getting Katrinas and tsunamis and earthquakes. God says, I gave you this creation. I said, please be a steward of creation. Look after it. Look after it gently. Look after it caringly. Look after it. Hey, walk, walk, walk on the ground gently. Walk, remember, it really is holy ground. Walk, walk, and God says, you know, some of my best, my best collaborators have always been young. Hey, 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 you young people. Don't, don't allow yourselves to be infected by the cynicisms of oldies like me. <laughs> dream, the idealistic dream. Dream and say, yes, war will be no more. We will have a world where we recognize that, hey, we actually belong in one family. We belong in one family. You are my sister. You are my brother. We belong in one family. God says,
Archbishop Tutu, on behalf of the Division of Humanities, the Farquhar College of Arts and Sciences, and Nova Southeastern University, it is my honor to present you with this gift, this token of our appreciation and gratitude for your visiting us today. Thank you all for coming. Good night. <laughs>